quiet seaside town, an evil lain to rest centuries ago, has risen. An abandoned fortress deep in the swamp holds a secret that could save the village or destroy it. Now, a band of adventurers sets out to dig up the wounds of the past and bring the light of day to the roots of ruin. This is Tabletop Gold. Welcome to Tabletop Gold. My name is Lars Castine. Welcome to the show. We're going to have a great time on the podcast today. We've got exciting things happening in the game, and we've got important things to get to before that. Let's say hello to everybody who's going to be involved in tonight's festivities. Robin Lang is here. Good evening. I, I don't know if I'm entirely here, though, so we'll see how involved I am. Parts oh. of Robin Lang are here <laughs> for now. Our Matt Humphreys is here. Good that partial presence of your body time yep david chernikoff the tin man is here i don't even understand what Ro robin what are you talking about i don't know i was just <laughs> responding to what lars said yep and i gotta migrate <laughs> again what do you want from me <laughs> i i don't want anything i genuinely i don't i okay well good Brain i'm broke, entirely good <laughs> i'm entirely present for each of you oh you're in the game with you. me and for each of you who is listening nothing partial about it full devotion and attention and if at any point i ask anyone to repeat themselves it's because uh -huh. i was paying too much attention when they said <laughs> too much <laughs> attention you care too much and zoe chernikoff is here hello good care time good care time it is the second week of march it is the second week of starch madness and let's talk to david chernikoff to kick off the festivities for the starch bracket that we are in the middle of. David, what's going on with these starches? What matchups do we have going on tonight? And what a season it's been, right? In reverse order. Absolutely. Tonight, we have two matchups to round out the semifinal bracket, which I will preview in a moment. So just for those of you keeping track at home, it was reverse order, but now I'm changing the order from reverse order in order to go back to the first topic, which is what's happening with all these starches. And the answer there is, on last week's show, we went through the first four of our remaining eight starches, and we determined that French fries would be advancing in a squeaker over corn on the cob. I can Shocking. say squeaker, because we're not doing hogs anymore, so it's not weird. Mm -hmm. And uh, mashed potatoes advancing over steamed rice. So that means, folks, that the both of the top seeds from the potatoes have advanced over the staple grains. The staples have been eliminated in their entirety. To review, the two regions we have not yet visited are the wild card region and the bread zone. Ooh. Who will go on to face the mighty potatoes in the final four? Our first <laughs> matchup here in week two of Starch Madness 2024. This is so exciting. This is so exciting. I cannot wait to hear what this is. The top seed in the bread zone region, Ooh. number one bread zone entrant, pasta with tomato sauce, mm. Mm. facing off against the second seed in the wild card region, a nice, crisp, starched collar, uh, shirt collar. Mm. Why don't you do that again? A nice, crisp, starched shirt collar. That's right, a crisp, starched, starched shirt collar. I had wow. as much trouble reading that as I had saying that. And it's because I'm paying so much attention. <laughs> we are going to go for an initial take on this one. Pasta with tomato sauce versus a nice, crisp, starched shirt collar. We're going to start it off with Zoe Chernikoff. Interesting. Setting the tone. This is a lot I... of responsibility, Zoe. 
I have to go with the with the noodles with tomato sauce. I, I feel like there's a little bit of a gendered thing here. I have neither a fondness for a stiff starched <laughs> shirt collar, nor do I use them. And like, I don't actually like that sort of crispiness to me isn't a the, like, you know how we got in the last year with the hog wash is like the er hog or warthog. I don't think it is. Like, I know it has the word starched in it, but no, it seems this seems frankly easy. It's the pasta with tomato sauce. Okay. A first vote for pasta with tomato sauce. Interesting. Interesting. Edging out a nice, crisp, starched shirt collar, which is so hard to say. I'm just totally staggered. <laughs> um, we'll, we'll move now to, I think, Armat Humphreys is going to be next. Armat, what do you make of this matchup? I will say, I, I kind of like it when, you know, you get a, a button-up shirt and, like, the collar is, like, a little stiff and... um it's like, ooh, this is kind of like it's been washed out, but also like chemically treated in a way that's kind of unpleasant, but also is kind of pleasant. <laughs> that said, pasta, obviously pasta. Like, okay, it's pasta. not even a contest. Yeah. Pasta. pasta is the <laughs> Robin, what do you think? Which way are you leaning? Pasta with tomato sauce or a nice, crisp, starched shirt collar? Well, you know, I I do. I am a sewer. I do make clothes. I do appreciate like. When you make, when I make a shirt collar and it does, like, I got to use the tool to poke out the corners of it to get the edges, to get the points yeah. nice and pointy and you okay. iron it flat. And there's something really satisfying about it. But if I put it them up in a fight, coming. yeah. but if I put them up in a fight against each other, <laughs> that pasta sauce is destroying that shirt. Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah. And also. That's good point. Interesting. I'm, I'm like, you, you cannot wear a nice button down shirt while eating pasta. Pasta wins every time. And I'm also married to an Italian man, so I've got to go with the pasta with red sauce. It is a yeah. staple in my household. Yeah, yeah you know, it's, I, I had not considered actually like trying to mentally conjure these things, actually fighting one another, <laughs> right? I've been thinking of these as more abstract battles. But now that you mention it, pasta with tomato sauce would, as it were, beat a, a shirt. <laughs> it's, that's like the, that's the, the classic shot from the, like, early to mid 90s um, uh, detergent commercial where for some yes. reason this yes. family has is in the course of one 12 minute span they have eaten tomato sauce they have um, like uh, squirted chocolate sauce on themselves for some reason mom <laughs> is just throwing wine red wine all over the children Can you blame there's her mud at that point? everywhere yeah, no. grass usually there's Total usually grass, grass on stuff mm -hmm. yeah that's a, that's a great read and then uh, you know <laughs> All and it's all gone, except it's never all gone, you know. Like, the, the, the it's, it's like there's one with Tide and one with generic brand, and the one with generic brand looks identical to how it did before, and the one with Tide looks mostly clean, but there's still yeah. a little bit of dirt. They don't want to over promise, yeah. like, because they know about the power of, of, a, of a bowl of pasta with red sauce. They understood yeah. that it was an unwinnable fight. Pretty sure I actually have a baby picture of me like covered in pasta and red sauce. And Obligatory. It is one of my favorite um, yeah. baby pictures. Obligatory. It's a rite of it's a rite of passage. And speaking of rites of passage, Lars. Yes. Uh, you have a meaningless vote to cast. What? <laughs> yeah. Having heard out all the arguments. <laughs> yes. What do you make of this question? First off, I'm disgusted by all of you. You should all be ashamed of yourselves for yeah. the votes that you've cast. It's reprehensible. It undermines oh, wow. the question of what it is that we're doing here. We're talking about the ultimate starch, and you just denied the only competitor, as far as I know, with the word starch in its name. I I understood what Armat was saying, where it's pleasant, but it's unpleasant. It, there's a shapeliness to it. But it's meant it's meant for looking. It's it's a show, it's a show collar. It's not a business collar. You're not supposed to be eating pasta. You're not supposed to be <laughs> throwing pasta sauce up in the air and ducking underneath it while you're wearing such a shirt. There is a certain dignity that we have lost in this country. Wow. And the moment that we lost it is when these millennials stopped learning how to do their laundry correctly. They stopped knowing how to starch a shirt. They stopped using bleach. Everyone's wearing stains all over the place. Everybody looks like garbage. And it's all because they turned their back on the starched collar shirt just like you did. Political rallies across the country this election season, the chant yes. starch baby starch is going to sweep the masses. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Starch baby starch. Well, so uh, so yeah, can... I'm voting for I'm voting for pasta because that's ridiculous. <laughs> oh, like okay. why would you want this starched shirt? 
Come on, David. What do you? What are? You, where, how are you voting? What's going on? Well, uh, yeah, I'll say I'll say two things. The first is that I'm voting for pasta, and the second is that I love when we do this. And when Lars gets to step out of the hosting chair and let fly, it makes me feel like we have this show has a Pegasus (laughs) that most of the time is forced to pull a plow. (laughs) And every once in a while, we just let it free of its reins and we just and we get to just watch it glide, soar up, (laughs) uh, wheeling and, and diving in through the sky as it stretches its wings and, you know, in full glory. And then, um, obviously, we we rip it back down to earth and we yeah. we strap it to a like Bellerophon. <laughs> yeah, we That's we right. strap it to a thresher again and and force it to um to remind us uh, rules that we should have learned a hundred episodes ago. Uh, so Lars, I love thank that you. we're the nightmare Amish in this scenario. <laughs> I mean, the nightmare. Just Amish. ask Lars. We are the nightmare. <laughs> yeah. good. I've had nightmares. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Good, good English time, everyone. All right. The final episode in the round of eight here in Starch Madness 2024 is between the number one seed in the wild card bracket and the number mm-hmm. two seed in the bread zone. Mm-hmm. The number one seed in the wild card bracket is Tater Tots. That's right. Tater Tots. Why is there a wild the number- card and not Potato. Versus the number two you seed. You have to subscribe to the Patreon if you want to find that out. So. <laughs> I do. I just don't listen to it. It's too much content. It's well worth every penny you pay for it. But So you can, you can do so by visiting tabletopworld.com <laughs> and you click on the button at the top that says Patreon. It is pretty straightforward. Okay. The number two seed in the bread zone, which will be facing off against Tater Tots, is Focaccia. Mm. Focaccia. And we will start this one with our Matt Humphreys. Oh, geez. I, I'm i going to go focaccia just because I actually do not like tater tots all that much. So um, explain I, yourself. I, I, I just I find them the like the grease always gets too greasy on them. And like, I just want a French fry instead, you know, like that's always where I come out. Um, but, but, you know, my, I, I do not assume that my opinion there is universal. Um, I don't know if Robin's video is frozen or if she is actually closing her eyes and looking down and like counting to 10 or something. Oh, I see what's happening. Robin is casting Ray of Frost on our map. Um, yes. Okay. So, so our Matt casts an initial vote for Focaccia. Some excellent groundwork laid. Robin, what do you make of this? Focaccia versus tater tots. Now, I'm actually, with my spring break, I believe, coming up next week, I am planning on baking a focaccia soon. Um, I've always wanted to. Mm, Split allegiances. It always shows up on my um, Instagram. And it just looks lovely. And a nice, squeezy, squishy focaccia that is kind of Never, I didn't think of it as a starch. It's just such a lovely bread. But um, I am quite the opposite of Armat. If I have a choice between French fries and tater tots, it is tater tots every time, as a matter of fact. Tater tots are the perfect child of, a, of mashed potatoes and French fries. The inside is wow. usually fluffy and lovely, and the outside has that wonderful crispness that you look for in a French fry. They are... As much as I said earlier, French fries are the perfect food. I, I, the really the thing is a potato is a perfect food, but tater tots are the height of potato perfection. Tater so, tots. which was your vote? Sorry, tater tots. <laughs> okay, uh, Lars, what say you? I love this matchup. This is my favorite matchup in the entire tournament so far. I think that Armat's commentary was preposterous and <laughs> should be. <laughs> Should be looked back on as a stain on the history of this podcast. The <laughs> fact that you're like tater tots are greasy when focaccia is the greasiest food known to man is it's just so strange. Yeah, pretty much to olive me. oil. Like, point of yeah. order: it's oily, uh, Your Honor. Not What's the greasy. diff? What's the diff, buddy? What oh. are you talking about? What what is the difference between I, greasy I think, and oily? And I had never thought about this before, but just I I have no no axe to grind here. I think that greasy is 
oil that's been cooked. Okay, I like. I, I'll take that. I think. I think focaccia is oily. Okay, and tater tots okay. that oil's been cooked, so it becomes greasy. I. Ju- this is off the dome, but I, I kind of stand by it. That All right. Well, then I retract me, yeah. my. Uh, I retract my negative commentary. Oh, don't do that. You don't have to do that. Oh, no, no. no. Oh, okay. I, okay, I urge good. you to continue it, frankly. <laughs> Keep it wrong. I'm trying to sharpen your negative commentary. I'm trying to. I think that it. focaccia is like kind of gross. It's so heavy. It's so thick. It's so oily. It's far too herbaceous. There's too much rosemary on focaccia. Your hands smell like focaccia for the rest of the day. You can't eat it along with something else. You get like focaccia and something. By the time you get to something, you're full of focaccia. Tater tots <laughs> have like been. Focaccia, am I right? Ex- you are right. <laughs> Thank you. Tater tots have been a low tier potato uh, for, for me for, for years. I've thought of tater tots as like baby french fries. These are french fries that children eat. These are not something that an actual adult would ever choose to eat. But then. Then, my friends, there is a movie theater you in Brooklyn. tried one. I tried. Then I <laughs> ate it. <laughs> There's a movie theater in uh, in Brooklyn called the Nighthawk Theater that is like one of these theaters that has a kitchen. They bring you food throughout the meal and so on. They have a tater tots mm. at the Nighthawk with a queso sauce mm. that you can dip the tater tot into it. And that, as a movie-going experience— the the hard exterior of the tater tots, the fragmented sort of minced potato inside of that thing, combined with this queso dip that has scallion chives in it, chives in it. Ooh. It's incredible, and for that reason, I'm voting for tater tots. Thank you. I, uh, I relinquish the rest of my time. I remember <laughs> eating those tater tots while watching the Phantom Thread. The gentleman from memory. Queens, Hell yeah. it. Yeah, um, the chair recognizes uh, the the gentle lady from Richmond. Zoe, what do you got? So I had like a whole thing here that was like, you know, very genuine about how when you can't eat gluten, gluten-free focaccia, blah, 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 blah. I think as Lars was talking, uh, it occurred to me and then there was like a serendipity affirmation moment. As we talked about last time, basically it turns out that if you can melt a bunch of butter on it, I like it. I think I'm also realizing that if a fake liquid cheese product is appropriately eaten with it, then I also like it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And therefore tater tots. This is, this is easy for me. You don't do, you don't do fake melted cheese on focaccia. So I'm, it's tater tots. Wow. Well, uh, the tots have it and I have to express, I I just want to step out (laughs) of my role. David loves focaccia. (laughs) It's it's a delightful <laughs> bread. I want to step out of my role as host and 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 just like let you into a little personal like what's happening for me personally right now, <laughs> which is that the fact that tater tots has already won, and that means that I am free to vote my conscience, oh. which is for focaccia, <laughs> is such a huge relief. All of the reasons that Lars listed that he finds focaccia to be a problematic food are all of the things I love about it. <laughs> Honestly, Lars, I could not I, I, I could not have said it better. It is oily. It is salty. It is herbaceous. And when they bring it to you before a meal, you have so much of it that then you don't need the meal anymore. Those are the reasons why I love this food. I can still remember. I told this story on the other episode, so I will just... I will just, I won't, I won't do it again. I still remember the first focaccia I ever had. I, 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 it's like I'm tasting it right now. If I could sleep on a bed of focaccia, I would. And it would poison my wife, but I'd still have to do it. <laughs> wow. Wow. Do you ever I get love- a place where they have like the balsamic <laughs> dipping sauce and you put that right in the, and you dip the focaccia in the balsamic sauce? That's really nice. I would do that, but I loathe balsamic. But like, mm-hmm. I get what yeah. you mean, you know? Anyway, I'm just relieved that there isn't a focaccia bed, so I will never face that choice. Just in the exact same way, I am relieved that Tater Tots already won by the time it got to me. <laughs> so I did not face that choice. It's a lot of responsibility, for, for sure. All right. So starch, starch madness has nearly just about become potato madness, <laughs> which, I, which I think is pretty revealing. But I next week, we will debate the final four and advance only two to the final. The final four 
mashed potatoes, French fries, tater tots, and pasta with tomato sauce will vie for the title of Ultimate Starch. Tune in, folks. I think it's not going to take as long as this did. (laughs) Uh, And yeah, with that, uh, I'll toss it back to you, Lars, with just a brief reminder for everyone that if you want to hear the pre-show where the selection committee (laughs) narrowed the field of many starches to the AP Furnace debate, you can find that on our bonus feed. Visit tabletopgold.com. Click on the button at the top of the screen that says Patreon. All right. Well, thank you, David. We're going to do a just one more little bit of business, and then we're going to get into our game. I want to take a moment to thank everybody who has left a review of our podcast at their podcast app of choice. People are leaving reviews all the time. Uh, our audience has done so much nice stuff for us in reviewing our show. So thank you to everybody who has done that. But thank you in particular to the user Nice on Podcast Addict nice. who left a review that says, great fun. Feels like I'm at the table playing with friends. Now to get my phone back from the Baltic Sea. So <laughs> thank you to Nice. And thanks for tuning in from the Baltics. That's yeah. really cool. It makes me feel good. Yes. Agreed. Oh, yeah. You know what else is going to make you feel good? It's playing this game. Drowning. Let's do it. <laughs> you are in the fight for your lives in a flooded cavern hundreds of feet below ground. You came here in search of a key held by an aquatic devil known as a Sarglagon, and you seem to have found them. The Sarglagon lay in wait for you, hiding in a pond beneath the corpses of two dead hydras. As soon as you all had gathered around the shore, and as soon as Mag had critically failed two secret perception checks in a row. Okay. <laughs> you rolled two ones. Sense. I like, oh. I, I was wild. This watery devil surged up from its hiding spot and flooded this entire chamber with its infernal magic. So now, the four of you are struggling to keep afloat in this dank cavern, and the Sarglagon is whipping back and forth in the air above you, snickering to itself. The amulet key fragment that brought you here, dangling from its neck. Well, I think we found it. You found it. Uh, We're going to jump straight back into combat. There's one thing I want to do first off. I want to give David a hero point. Hooray! For Mag wading into the water so fearlessly to 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 start this off, I it was a very tense moment. I I enjoyed it, and the heroism of that I think went unnoticed, and that was a mistake. So the most recent thing that happened is this Sarglagon flew up into the air and cast a spell that filled the room with water. This Sarglagon is a large, twenty foot long, snake like creature with wings arms and a massive mouth with barb-like teeth and multiple golden eyes on its scaly, iridescent skin. All of you right now are waiting in at least 10 feet of water. And I want to just mention some swimming stuff as we're getting into some aquatic combat. Swimming is sort of like flying. If your turn ends without having spent an action to swim, you will sink, and then you'll have to start holding your breath, and we'll get into that when that happens. Also, this is still water that you're in. After this spell finishes up, you're once again in still, motionless, like underground pond water. So to swim 10 feet, you will not need to make an athletics check. But if you want to go further than that, if you want to go further than 10 feet with a swim action, you will need to make athletics checks and you'll need to get a critical success on a DC 10 check. If you do that, then you'll be able to swim 15 feet. (laughs) That's true for everyone except Mag, who currently has a swim speed of 20 feet thanks to a potion that she drank. So she can just freely swim 20 feet without needing to make any checks whatsoever, which is obviously great. 
Couple more things about swimming. If you're in the water and you don't have a swim speed, you are off guard. Attacks are modified if they go through water, which is not a big deal at the moment since the Sarglagon is flying. And I'm adding the rules for water combat, swimming, and suffocating to our chat so you can look at them yourself. Here you go. There they are. I just put them Sorry, in. Sorry, Lars, how far out does the water extend? We're all in it, but like, is there a part of this room that doesn't have the water or is it now the whole room is at least 10 feet of water? It is nearly the entire area. I'll draw a box for you. Okay. Around where this water is. Water, water everywhere. So that box is a 50 by 50 foot square that is filled entirely with water. 10 feet deep, at least. And it is now Istan's turn. The Sarglagon is in the air as you are swimming below it. It is just out of your reach. So what are you going to do? Istan is going to uh, make a spell strike. At... You can't. You're out, it's out of your reach. It's just past 10 feet because it is 10 feet up in the air and you are 10 feet oh, away from it. I see. I if see. you want to hit it, you're going to have to move. Okay. I will swim up to it. And then I'm going to do a spell strike with electric arc targeting the Sargagon. So the strike was a 16 on the die for a 32. That hits. Awesome. All so right. that is um, 16 bludgeoning from the staff. So the Sargagon resists some of that because it seems to be resisting non uh, some of this physical damage. Cool. Um, well, that makes sense with what we know about devils uh, a lot of the time. And then it does, uh, it would do, uh, depending on its reflex save, 10 electric damage. Okay, here comes the reflex save. Bad roll, 19. That is the failure. Okay, so I'm going to take all 10 of that electricity damage. So a total of 23 points of damage to the Sarglagon as Isthin swims up and reaches up in the air and just zaps and smashes the hell out of the Sarglagon. It twitches back and flaps its wings and recoils and goes like, <laughs> at Istin. Cool. And it is now Ao's turn. Ao is treading water in 10 feet of water. What is Ao going to do? Ao looks at Trill and says, Trill, Trill, can, can you give us a boost? And delays her turn. Okay. It is now Trill's turn then. Okay. So I think the first thing that Trill will do then is going to do a lingering composition. And the question is, do I do Courageous Anthem or Dirge of Doom? I think I'm going to try Dirge of Doom. Uh, I rolled a 24. Yeah, that that is a success only because of your investment in the Virtuosic Performer feat. Love so that. three rounds of Frightened One on the Sarglagon. Yes, okay. For my second action, I will swim. And for her third action, she's going to recall knowledge. Great. Um, to try and figure out uh, weaknesses and... Um, Ideally, weak to, first weaknesses, but then if it's um, uh, if it's immune to anything. Okay. Um, Give and me I can a use, blind. I can use my devil lore, this. right? Perfect. Blind devil lore. Let's go. Okay. So the first thing you asked for was uh, was weaknesses. Weaknesses, yeah. Okay. You know that this creature, this sarglagon is weak to acid damage. Okay. Okay. And that's all I got? That's all you got. Okay. Better than nothing. Yes. It's uh, it's turn. fine iridescent scales are weak to corrosive damage, it seems as though is Dang. the situation. I think we did grab some acid um, flasks. Great. It is now Ao's turn as Trill sings a scary song treads water and recalls some knowledge. What is Ao going to do? 
Ao, I don't think Ao likes water much. I don't know. I feel like many canine type things do. Our dog doesn't. Uh, and I spend more time with our dog than other canine creatures. So in my mind, water comes in and Ao gets kind of panicky. Um, she swims 10 feet up to the sort of northwest just to like get herself. I, I think she's like looking to see if she can get her feet under her. Like, oh, does it get shallower here? It doesn't. Spoiler. And so I think Ao looks up at this thing and, uh, you know, treading, splashing, spluttering, starts uh, reciting a spell at it. Uh, it's within range, right? It's 30 feet? Yeah. Okay, cool. That's what I thought. Um, and starts doing Teeth to Terror. Your little teethies are going to wind up in my pouch. Um, it's just really creepy, weird stuff. Which Genuinely, it's hard yeah. to terrifying. imagine. It yeah. was. It was so no. casual. And, uh, <laughs> really freaked us all out. Um, <laughs> so what do I have to do? You have to do a will save. All right. I rolled a 25 on my will save. It's a 23 will save. So you take half damage. Is that how this? Or you do no damage. I, oh, Success. Damage. The target takes half damage. Yeah. Well, Lars, you'll take three points of damage and no persistent mental damage. What a good spell this is. It is really good. I agree. <laughs> but look, you weren't immune to any of that damage. I, um, no, I'm oh, not but immune are you to flat, mental you're damage. You're flat-footed to me, so shouldn't that be six? Sneak attack damage only gets added on attacks. This is not an attack. This is a saving uh, throw, so. Well, there you go. What a good turn. I'm proud of myself. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> it's now the beginning of round two. Ao, Trill, and Isthen are fanned out across the southern wall of this flooded underground chamber. The Sarglagon, 10 feet above the surface of the water, flapping its wings just in front of Mag, who is due north of the Sarglagon. It's Mag's turn. What is Mag going to do? Um, so David has two questions. The first is, can Mag be made to fly or is my, um, my swim potion going to prevent that? Fly is not a polymorph spell. Oh. So you could be, a, you could be targeted with the fly spell if you so wanted to yeah. be. And... I I do. I mean, what I can do down here is pick up anyone who starts to drown, which is not nothing. But what I can't do much of from down here is damage. Um, and I think of myself no as more of a... Bash. Yeah, more of a basher than a lifeguard. What so, about those bolas? Just throw some bolas around. Those have always worked Any in the past. I, and I could throw the silver uh, hatchet but I think I can only do that once because then it's going to fall to the bottom yeah. of the lake. That's a good point. No matter what yeah, you throw, sounds, it's going to be... That sounds right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> those up must go down to the bottom of the lake. Yes. So uh, Mag is going to swim over to Trill. I genuinely do not know what the hell else to do to this thing. I guess I'll try to demoralize it. It's already frightened one, so if you get a critical success, you might not get down to frightened two. I've never passed one of these checks, period, let alone a crit. <laughs> if I throw the bola, does the bola come back to me, or does the bola sink to the bottom of the pond? I don't really yeah. know what a bola is. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, so if <laughs> you throw the like bola, it tries to like wrap around the thing and pull right. it down. So right. if you miss it, it falls to the bottom of the lake. Yes. Uh, yeah. Well... And I believe it's a plus one striking bola, so That's we true. don't want to lose that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is one of the nicest bolas that has ever been in a game of Pathfinder. <laughs> Wait till we put a returning rune on it. <laughs> Can I save an action for next turn? You could spend two actions to ready an action and then tell me a trigger that will trigger that action. Can I ready the action of like launching myself in flight if if trill makes me fly yeah will that somehow save me anything i don't, yeah. I don't really you could move down 
towards Trill, that's one action. Spend yeah. two actions to, once you are flying, once you have a fly speed, to fly. So then I will start flying when? When, when I Trill, cast fly. Yeah. I'll immediately go up in the air at that point. Yeah. So I'll head over there, and then I'll prepare. I will, uh, in the words of Foo Fighters, learn to fly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Mag considers her options, swims down towards Trill, and then prepares to take another action. And it is now the Sarglagon's turn. The Sarglagon sails, flies swiftly down to the surface of the water just behind Isthen and starts casting a spell. Would I be in, could, uh, does that trigger a reactive strike or is it too high up for me when it does it, that? It was too high up when it, when it was closer to okay. you and now it is away from you. Cool. A swirling torrent of water manifests from its mouth as it gestures and intones an incantation and a straight line bursts out from its mouth hitting Isthen, Mag, and Ao, who are all in a straight line. Mm -hmm. And I need each of you to please make a fortitude save. Yep. So glad I'm one square away. Okay, starting with Mag, how did you do? 20 on the die for 37. That's a critical success. How did Ao do? 18 on the die for a 29. Jeez, these rolls. Okay, that's a success, not a critical success. How did Isthen do? Uh, 10 on the die for a 23. <sighs> okay, so those are all either critical successes or successes, meaning that Ao and Isthen are only going to take half of 29 points of bludgeoning damage. Cool. You feel yourselves being pushed back as this fire hose blast of water slams into your face, but you manage to resist strongly enough that you do not actually get pushed away. And that is the Sarglagon's turn. It is now Isthen's turn. That Sarglagon is now breathing down your neck, swimming on the surface of the water, no longer flying. What will Isthen do? Well, off the bat, I think he'll recoil from the thing's breath and be like, oh, didn't you chew a spreading experiment or something at some point? So I think uh, Isthen is going to sort of point his staff while treading water with one hand at it and just like whip it around his head and toss a like, as it is like going around his head, like this green, vile, acidy, ethereal energy gathers around it and it just flicks off the end of his staff when he points it at the um, Sarglagon. And that will potentially be eight damage coming at the Sarglagon. Okay, here comes a reflex save. Six on the die, I get a 19. Hell yeah. So that is uh, eight damage, acid. Unfortunately, this creature is in the water, so it is going to resist five points of that acid damage, and it mm. also seems as though it is not weak to acid damage, actually. So you do a total of three points of damage to it. <laughs> cool. Well, that's and shitty. So, if so I uh, failed that. <laughs> recall knowledge. Nice. You know, I, I wondered if... But I, I dared to dream, and... Um, uh, anyway, Isthen is then not going to drop into his arcane cascade stance uh, Hi, and instead Isthen. will use his action to swim in place uh, for yet another turn. And that will be it. Okay. Isthen casts a spell and treads some water. It is now Trill's turn. Trill sees Mag waiting for a fly spell, but also sees that this monster is no longer flying. So what is Trill going to do? So I think I'm going to cast it anyway. So that should the Sarglagon uh, go in the air again, Mag is able to chase it. Okay. Um, I feel like that's the correct option here. So Trill's going to first swim, uh, tread water for a moment, catch your breath. <laughs> okay. Um, and then she's going to reach out and touch somebody, um, touch your friend uh, with consent and cast fly on Magdaruna. Okay. I do I do consent. And Mag is now able to move. 
spending a reaction to move. Okay, well, then I will fly over 20 feet. Yeah, so I'm sort of creating a little blockade phalanx thing with Isthen, but I am up in the air above above this thing. So Mag is up in the air, and it is now Ao's turn. Ao is about 30 feet away from the action. What is Ao going to do? I've got an edge case scenario situation for you. Great. My plan is to use athletics to try and pass this DC 10 thing to swim 15 feet. I believe that puts me literally on the edge of this spell. So will I be in water or not? You will be in water if you are within the spell. So yes, you'll be in water. But I'm on the edge of it. I'm just <laughs> literally giving you the an edge case scenario. <laughs> literally, I'm, I'm just, you see what I did? I'm giving guys? you a clear answer to your clear question. But I'm I, saying I don't know I'm like to, right on the purple you. line. I don't know if that's in or out. There you go. <laughs> I just moved the purple line to 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 move it. To I didn't well, snap the cheating. grid. I'm not cheating. I told you the answer to your question. And you Always started snap bargaining. To grid, Lars. There's no snap to grid on this thing. <laughs> um. Okay. Ao swims 15 feet to what should have been dry land, but now isn't because Lars is literally changing boundaries as we oh, play. Wow. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> she pulls out chompers, uh, and as best she can, sort of wetly lines chompers up and fires off a silver arrow, one one silver arrow at um, this beautiful, beautiful monster. So, Ao bought silver arrows back at town. Isn't that cool? Got some well, silver foresight. arrows. Very smart. So you are um, far enough away from the Sarglagon at this point that you are going to take a penalty to your roll because you're outside of the range of your bow. But let's see what happens. No, the bow is a 60-foot range. What? Right? It does? I'm pretty sure. Does it? It does. You're right. Yeah. Hero point for me Wait. for being wrong. No? <laughs> That's two cheats I in think one it goes turn. the other way. You've exceeded your <laughs> cheat capacity, sir. <laughs> All right. That was a 26 to hit. The 26 hits, despite the fact that you're shooting through friends, only <laughs> because Trill managed to Ooh. get them frightened and yeah. off guard to you. So oh, that yeah. is a neat little hit. So yes, roll damage, hey, please. Hey, thanks, Trill. All right. Hero point for Trill? <laughs> <laughs> Lars already gave himself the hero point. May All right, I that is 13 more, points of damage. 13 points of damage. And you hear the Sarglagon screech as all 13 of those points go through, hero point to Ao. For getting silver arrows back at town. There we go. Um, the silver arrow just kept it from being resistant to the physical damage? Is that basically? Correct. Oh, yeah. cool. Hey, that's fun. <laughs> it is fun. And you know what else is fun? <laughs> You've got one more action. Oh, no, I swam. And I pulled out the bow. Okay. So the other thing that's fun is that it is round three and the situation has changed. The Sarglagon is swimming on the surface of the water with Mag and Isthin right next to it. Mag is floating five feet above that surface of the water and Trill is a short distance away and Ao is a long distance away swimming in an improbably water-filled space. It is now Mag's turn. Well, I want to hit it with the hammer, with my big hammer. We're here for that. So with my first action, I will hit it with the hammer. Hit it! Oh, interesting. I have the wrong hammer out. That's what I should have done last turn. <laughs> You don't have an actual silver hammer on you? I believe that I had the Earthbreaker out. I wouldn't Did have had Mag a buy a silver hammer, David? Oh, yes. Mag bought Maxwell's silver hammer. Uh, 
back in town last time, I, we invested in a silver hammer to go along with the Earthbreaker. It is a plus one striking silver war hammer. Pretty cool. I'm trying to figure out would I have had that hammer out at the beginning of the fight or not. We thought we were fighting a Hydra. We were, we were hoping there was a devil nearby. We were wondering if the Hydra was a devil. I guess we were here looking for a devil. You mentioned an Earthbreaker a couple times, so I think you got the Earthbreaker yeah. out. Yeah, yeah. So I got to I gotta swap it. So first I will... Is that a free action with the remaster? It is a one action, one action. swap instead of having to drop something and then draw something right. for free, which is huge when you're better, flying yeah. over water. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So let's do it. And here comes the strike. Oh, almost landed on 17. Instead, it's only a seven, which I suspect is not going to do it. What is your, what's your total? 23 to hit. Yeah, that misses. All right. Um, all right. Last action. I'm just going to try another swing. You, if you can. do not spend an action flying, you will fall into the water. I will spend my third action flying. Thank you. Okay, Mag pulls out a silver warhammer, misses the Sarglagon, and it is now the Sarglagon's turn. The Sarglagon is going to swim 10 feet under the surface of the water, right underneath Isthen. He's Sarglagon! <laughs> will that trigger a reactive strike? That will trigger. That will trigger a reactive strike. Yes. Here did, it is. Did, did no one else appreciate our match? I thought it there. was great. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, guys. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was really too busy. That. Too busy running the game. Too um, busy trying to kill us. So what did you roll in that reactive strike? Thirty. That is going to hit. Yes. Well, that's a nice feeling. Twenty-three damage. Twenty-three damage. You hear the Sarglagon call out in pain as it disappears underneath the surface of the water. And. Isthen starts feeling his lungs fill with water as a magical effect starts happening to Isthen. I need Isthen to make a fortitude save. Oh boy. All right. Um, 31. Okay. You start coughing that water up and you become <coughs> sickened <coughs> one. Oh. Tastes so bad. That's just like stale. And with that, as this creature is twenty is twenty feet underwater. Jesus. It is now Isthen's turn. Isthen, you look down, you can see this this creature, its lamprey eel like teeth situated just below you, through the water. I would like to tell you something about aquatic combat if you would like to hear it. Yeah, I would love to. If you are trying to make an attack through water, which you would be in this situation, you take a minus two circumstance penalty to melee slashing or bludgeoning effects that pass through that water. Ranged attacks that deal bludgeoning or slashing damage automatically miss if they're underwater. And there you go. That's the story. What, what uh, arrows going through water? What? Which which of those? They're piercing, right? Arrows going through water uh, would work out just fine. Great, that's great. I love that. I love that for oh. me. Well, given the situation, Isthen is gonna blast the Sarglagon with electric arc. Oh gosh! <laughs> Electricity and water, notoriously a safe choice. I was wondering that too. Does that it, have a thing? It's not listed on the. Aquatic combat it's just rules, like at least. throwing a magic toaster into this giant bathtub <laughs> we're all hanging out in. I was almost out of it. Well, make a DC 23 reflex save, please. I rolled a 20 on my reflex save. Oh, well, that is lower than 23. So that is a failure and you will take 14 Zapparuni damage. So the Sarglagon starts shaking around in the water beneath you as it grins at you and suddenly just... <laughs> And you see its skeleton through its body yes! like Daniel Stern in Home Alone. Let's go. Hell yeah. Cool. And you have one more action that you need to use to swim. 
Uh, yes, I'm going to use that action to swim. Are you staying in place or are you moving somewhere? You know what? Maybe don't be directly on top of the Sargalon. But if it comes up, then would it like lift him and he could ride it? <laughs> Is this crazy? This might be a little crazy. I'm going to... You know what? I'm not going to blast uh, be, be hitting if it's underwater. I swim. Sorry. Okay. So Istin swims and as Trill sees the Sargalagon get electrocuted underwater, it is now her turn. I'm going to actually try out a cantrip. So we did a, you let me rearrange things a little bit after remaster. So I have a different cantrip than I used to. Great. Um, Because days got even worse. So we got rid of days and also... Istin already had days, so there's an, that wasn't a reason for Trill to hold on to it. I want to try out Phase Bolt, but the range is 30 feet. So with the Sargalon underwater, am I in range? I think you are, yeah. I don't need to swim 5 or 10 feet to make that work? I think you are okay from here. Okay, cool. So, so Trill's going to swim in place then to not drown. And then we're going to try out Phase Bolt. And that's a 31. That hits somehow. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so that's going to be 18 points of piercing damage. And it resists some of that as its skin uh, fends off some of that, but it does take a still sig- significant hit as you yes. continue chipping away at this creature. She feels very excited. She rarely gets to do attacks. <laughs> that was fun. That's my turn. <laughs> Trill treads water and fires a bolt of magic down into the murky water. And it is now Ao's turn. Ao is, has swum to the surface. She's standing on the edge of water like she is on the edge of a, of a jello mold. The water is just sort of sustaining like a wall, a squishy wall right in front of you. Like Hell's Own Infinity Pool. <laughs> yes, exactly. Ao, I guess, sort of uh, slides down the edge of this thing, ten feet. Wee, she says. Uh, <laughs> so that she's j- just past it, no longer needs to swim, um, and then quickly fires two arrows straight back towards the circle on, um, hoping to do some more damage to it. And so this is like you shooting an arrow straight into this like wall of water because you're standing basically on the level that this Sarglagon is swimming in. So from Ao's position, it's straight ahead, but from Istin's position, it's 20 feet straight down. It's a mind-bending tactical situation right here. Now we're in Hellzone Aquarium, I guess. <laughs> um, okay, off we go. Uh, 29 to hit. That hits. Pretty good damage roll there, too. 21 points of damage. Dang. As another silver arrow pierces the water and finds its target, like, trailing little bubbles of air behind it as it just... And hits the Sargalgon beneath Istin and Mag. I said I was going to get your little teethies in my pouch, and I meant it. She (laughs) mumbles quietly to herself, firing off another arrow. Uh, That's just a 14. Okay. So that one is going to miss. Two quick arrow shots. Is that the end of your turn? Yes. Two quick arrow shots from AO, and we are now at the top of round four. Let's bring this thing home. Mag is flying five feet in the air above the surface of the water. The Sarglagon is 20 feet below the surface of the water. Istin. Trill swimming, treading water on this magically sustained water as Ao is far to the west, standing on dry land, peering into the water like she is at the world famous Baltimore <laughs> Aquarium. It is now Mag's turn. It's it's how far below the water? Twenty feet down. Twenty feet. What I want to do is dive down and hit it, and I think I can do that because I think. The first five feet of my range would be flight to the surface of the water. Then normally I wouldn't be able to swim far enough. I have, I did use this consumable. It gives me a swim speed. So I could get down 
deep enough and I have this insane breath control. So I think I can be down there for a while before it gets to be an issue. Your breath control is so insane that I'm not even going to bother tracking it. Yeah. (laughs) I like this idea of Mag essentially like almost like the move that the devil pulled off in the first place of like, like some winged kingfisher yeah. flying and then diving into the water to attack. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's like, um, it's like when you see videos shot from underwater of aquatic birds diving right. down beneath in order to look for, for fish. So, Magdaruna Penguin Skull Crusher. <laughs> Let's go. Penguin <laughs> Skull Crusher. Well, no, penguins don't fly. Magdaruna Eagle Skull Crusher. Cormorant Skull Crusher. David, the, the way that this works mechanically is a bummer, and you're not going to like it. You have to spend a move action to fly down to hit the surface of the water and then spend a second move action to swim down. But you can get to the Sarglagon with two actions. With two actions. Okay, that, that works. Mag starts by taking a very brief, I don't know, uh, she she banks slightly upward in the air in order to create a little more momentum and get the angle right. And then she plunges down first two and then beneath the surface of the water, jetting herself down 20 feet until she is face to face once again with the Sarglagon. And as she does so, we hear her give a, a cry. Uh, so what would that sound like? It would sound something like, um, <laughs> checks out. Yeah. I didn't know she could do that. Yeah. And then once she's down deep enough, here is, a strike with Magwell's silver hammer. That is only a, a seven. So that's going to be the same 23 as before. That's not going to hit. I want to hero point that. Yes. Yeah, because do it. I yes. want Hell yeah. this strike to land very much indeed. David, um, there is a good hero point card. Yes. You know what, y'all? Yeah, I'm do it. with it. So do it. There is a hero point card available to us. Uh, it is called Just Better. Hero point card. Yeah. 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 That drop. Submitted by, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Evan from Norway. Could be Even. I'm, I'm not sure. My Norwegian is only intermediate. Stop it. You're being so humble. Your Norwegian is okay. beautiful, David. All right. Okay. Conversational, but not fluent. <laughs> it says the trigger is you want to re-roll a crucial roll with a hero point, and then it says in parentheses, consensus for crucialness needed. So Th- This came up earlier when Trill was yeah. singing a song, and I kiboshed it. I was like, that is not crucial. Yes. So I could do that again. I guess so. First, yeah, does it pass? Does it Past the golden tyrant threshold, I is this sufficiently like crucial? Possible death blow to this creature who's gone down underwater, and we don't know what's happening next. Feels crucial to me. And with Matt, like the whole image of like Mag diving in like a bird of prey. Yes, this, we got to make this work. Armand, what do you think? Um, I'm gonna say this is like Cassandra's band from Wayne's World. Crucial taunt. I agree. Also, Armet, get as close to that microphone as you just were for the end of that sentence forever. Clearly, Please never move your, never forward. move your face yeah. any further than oh. that from your microphone. Thank you. Wow, you sound great. Oh, thank you. Uh, when you just got right up in there, that th- there was something primal that just got released. That was good. <laughs> I agree. Oh, yeah. all right. <laughs> okay, Armet. I've been convinced. This is a crucial role. You can right. use Woo! your hero point. What do you even get for this thing? Instead of ro- roll, uh, re-rolling with 1d20, as you would with a typical hero point, roll instead 2d20 and keep the higher result. It's just better. Yeah. It's, it's a better. just better. It's like a true strike hero point. It's a true hero point. It is, thank you, Evan, even Evan from Norway. Evan? It's probably not Evan. That would be a very <laughs> unusual Yvonne? way to pronounce that second <laughs> E, but okay. 
All right, so here are <laughs> yeah. So here I was are two, the spelling. Sorry. Here Evan. are two, here are two here are two more uh, attack rolls. Well, only a slight improvement. One of the rolls was worse, and one was only slightly better. It's a twenty-five to hit. There's no way. There's no way. Even Aww. without the penalty that you get from oh, the. No. Uh, even without the penalty that you get from the aquatic combat swinging a bludgeoning weapon underwater, that wouldn't have that would not have done it. Fear didn't so, help enough there. I dislike the game. What can I say? <laughs> okay, well, it's a bad game. Thank you, Evan. Thank, thank you, you, Evan, yes. for Evan. joining. Good hero uh, point card. Bad, bad game rolls. Yeah, great hero <laughs> point card. I feel like I let you down. That's Norwegian how our listener. rerolls go, though. That's how our rerolls tend to go. It is. It is. It's rough. So, very in very quick succession, Ao punctures the water with an arrow, and then Mag punctures the water with her body, but the Sarglagon is still up. The Sarglagon seems interested in attacking Isthen, because Isthen is flat-footed and sickened, and the Sarglagon seems to be a bit of... A jerk <laughs> about this whole thing. Shocking. Shocking. I said that the Sarglagon was 20 feet below Isthen, so I don't think that it can reach, and that sucks. It has so, to So I'm going to risk the reactive strike by swimming up about 10 feet and away from Mag to get strongly focused just on Is then. Well, I'll, I'll take the reactive strike then. Okay. Oh, God. <laughs> almost came up 20. Oh, Instead, it's only a, only a 24. My, to be clear, y'all, my die rolls on these last four strike attempts were seven, five, nine, and eight. And none of them hit. Oof. And as Mag's hammer trails underwater, just missing the back of the Sarglagon's tail, Isthen feels Bang's clamp down on his leg. Mm. It's a 17 on the die, a 36 to hit. The bummer. That's a pick of a strike. Yeah, that's that's gonna do it. That might even be that must be a crit. That is in fact a crit. Ooh. That crit means that you take oh my 58 <gasps> points of damage. What? Wait, that's doubled, though. That is already doubled. I think Isthen's going to need a bigger okay, boat. Okay, I, mean, I thought we were going to double the 58. I saw 58 oh. come up and saw the 116 flashed in my mind, and I thought, huh? well. Holy So crow. Isthen is now near death. Would not have minded killing that thing any of the last four cracks I've had yeah. at it. And then... Uh, that crucial ruling seems like it kind of was. Yeah, sure was. Thanks. And then a tentacle reaches out towards Isthen. Trying to pull him down. Trying to go all Sam Raimi on me, huh? That's a 30 to hit. That'll hit. Isthen takes... 14 more points of damage. Woof. All right. Well, Isthen has 13 hit points left, so that oh. knocks him out and Yikes. starts to drown. Here's yeah. where this, you start to drown, and it's, it's actually worse than that. It's worse than that because you feel poison seeping into your body, <gasps> oh, and no. I need you to make a fortitude save. Oh, oh good boy. Lord. This is... Um, Suddenly really that dire stakes. Yeah. Speaking of crucial roles, maybe we should have saved that hero point card. Thirty on uh, the sport save. That's a success, but not but a crit. Not a crit. That's fine. You don't need crits on on, on afflictions on poisons like that. But Isthen is now unconscious. My understanding is, at the end of Isthen's next turn. If he doesn't spend an action to swim, he will start to sink underwater. And once that happens, he will start drowning. It is now Trill's turn. 
Trill is going to immediately... Am I in the right range? Yes, Trill's within range to cast Soothe um, to try and Amazing. revive Isthen so that he can swim on his next turn and Mag can still go and try and hit um, the Sargalon. And that's 29 points of healing. Yes, and please. Thank you, Trill. Um, and then, so Trill kind of shouts out, Mag, you gotta get the Sargalon! And for Trill's last action, uh, she swims. That she Mag like underwater hears. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got the license to use the peanuts uh, adult voices. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, so that means Estin is awake and will be able to swim up next on his next action, right? Huge. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Just in case we don't end up killing the Sargalon uh, before then. Okay. It is now Ao's turn. Ao, again, standing on dry land, seeing this aquatic nightmare happening from a safe distance away. What is Ao going to do? I imagine this looks like total chaos. I guess she can sort of see through the water. Um, but as her turn begins, Ao uh, is starting to feel a little panicked, doesn't like being wet. And so she is going to use the hero point card called Your Turn Begins. Or I don't, sorry, it's called They Don't Stop Coming, They Don't Stop Coming, They Don't Stop Coming, They Don't Stop Coming. It is triggered by one's turn beginning, which is what's happening for her now. Hero point yeah. Ooh, that's a good one. Who's this Sometimes from? the best way to deal with an enemy is to turn them into dust, or maybe... Who's it? Yeah, who is it from? Oh, from Commissar Mitch. Yay. Thank you, Mitch. Thanks, Mitch. Thanks, Mitch. Woo. Thanks, Mitch. Welcome to our world. So sometimes the best wheel, uh, way to deal with an enemy is to turn them into dust. In this case, I feel like fish, fish chum or something like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> until the end of my turn, my multiple attack penalty cannot increase by any means. So I will get to Ooh. fire however many arrows I can in a three turn turn, which I think is three. <laughs> With no increase to multiple attack penalty, at the end of my turn, I will become stunned one. So there's a cost, but magic always comes with a price. Let's see how it goes. Okay. And just a reminder, the Sarglagon is no longer frightened because Trill's yeah. lingering com com composition has worn off oh, now. Oh, forgot about that. Yeah. So you will be doing just straight raw damage, throwing a that bummer, raw D. Here we are. All right, the first one is a really 20 large. to hit. That misses. How about a 19? That misses. Ooh, but that one is a 20 on the die. Will that hit? That'll hit. That'll hit. That'll do it. You gotta draw a Nice, nice, nice. Okay, we gotta draw a crit card. Let's see if we drew the Ooh. ace. I thought the for a king second we had, but it's spades. the king of spades. The oh, king gross. of spades. So this is just going to be straight ahead double damage from this silver arrow that has just found its target. Let's see how much how much critical damage we are looking at. I think it totally makes sense that like the first couple couldn't go through because like the light refraction issues with trying to well, figure Mag's out something down in the there water. Too. Maybe she doesn't know what she's aiming at. Um, yeah. she, I think she's panicky. Uh, that's 25 points of damage. One arrow misses, hits the ground just below Isthen's feet. Two arrows flies up out of the water. But then that third arrow hits the Sarglagon right in the mouth, killing it. And it yeah. floats up to the surface. Dead. Amazing. And we will pick up from there next time. Ooh, that was quite a fight. Good workout. The Roots of Ruin. It's a tabletop gold production produced under the Paizo Incorporated Community Use Policy using trademarks and copyrights owned by Paizo that are covered under that policy. 
Paizo does not recognize, endorse, or sponsor this project in any way, and we are expressly prohibited from charging you to use or access this content. For more information about Paizo Inc. and Paizo products, visit paizo.com. All original characters and content in The Roots of Ruin are the property of Tabletop Gold, and all rights are reserved. We at Tabletop Gold would love to hear from you. On our website, tabletopgold.com, you can learn more about us and our shows, pick up great merch, and connect to the best online community in all of podcasting. Thanks for listening.